Kello alkaa olla 20 yli 12, joten eikö olisi aika siirtyä takaisin ohjelman pariin. Ja seuraava puheenvuoro itse asiassa semmoinen, mitä mä oon henkilökohtaisesti ottanut jo tosi tosi paljon. Eli seuraavaksi meillä on Kuminaidoon, englanninkielinen videotervehdys. Ja Kumi on eteläafrikkalainen ihmis- ja ympäristöaktivisti. Kun hän oli 15, kuvittele 15, hän toimi justiinsa aktivistina ja näistä syistä hänet erotettiin koulusta ja joutui maanpakoon Englantiin. Siellä hän päätyi opiskelemaan Oxfordissa tohtoriksi poliittisessa, poli, poliittisessa sosiologiassa. Ja taannommin hän on työskennellyt erinäisissä järjestöissä, kuten ootas mä katon, Greenpeaceissa ja Amnestyssä. Eikö ollut ihan siis toiminnanjohtaja tai niin se tavallaan suuri grande hefe, ainakin mulla on tuttu nimenomaan Greenpeacein mm. toiminnanjohtajana, maailmanlaajuisen sellaisen siis. Yes. Ja sitten itse asiassa just Nelson Mandelan vapauduttua, niin hän palasi sitten sieltä Englannista Etelä-Afrikkaan ja jatko tätä työtä, mitä on tehnyt. Ja hän on omistanut oikeastaan koko elämänsä paremman maailman kehittämiseen. Mutta laitetaan seuraava videopätkä pyörimään ja... Eikä mä siirrytä lavalta pois, että te meitä tänne tullut katsomaan. Mä sanon vielä nopeasti, että kaikki nämä tämän tiivistämön puheenvuorot on nähtävissä maailmakylässä.fi nettisivuilla kaksi viikkoa tämän tapahtuman jälkeen. Eli esimerkiksi myöskin tämä seuraava puheenvuoro on siellä nähtävillä, joten pistäkääpä muistikirjaan se, mutta pitää mitä puhetta. Kiitos Anna. Ole hyvä. Dear friends and colleagues, we gather at a moment in world history when things are literally falling apart. In my country, South Africa, and in my home city, Durban, just a month ago, as a result of the worst flooding induced by climate, we lost 600 people. The climate crisis is here and now and requires us to act with urgency. Ah, you know, let me start again. Three, two, one. Dear friends and colleagues, I'm pleased to join with you at the World Village Festival to look at the challenges humanity is currently facing and what options do we have to get out of it. We face a convergence of crisis. The World Village Festival takes place at one of the most consequential moments of human history. What we do in the next 10 years will determine what kind of future humanity will have or whether we will have a future at all. The convergence of crises, namely an inequality crisis, a food crisis, a vaccine crisis, a human rights crisis, a corruption crisis, a terrifying climate crisis that we all experience has created a perfect storm or a boiling point, saying to us there is no space any longer for business as usual or government as usual. We must also have the courage to say that it cannot be activism as usual either. We need to have the courage to acknowledge that we have been unable to de deliver the levels of justice we would have hoped for, and that what has been delivered is nowhere near what the people of the world need and deserve. True, we are winning important battles against tremendous odds with very limited resources in some cases. But the brutal truth is that we are not winning the overall fight against injustice. As Amilka Cabral, the anti-colonial leader from West Africa once said, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. I want to tell you a story from 2015 when I was in the Pacific, in Kiribati, Fiji and Vanuatu. I learned a new slogan where people were saying, 1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 to stay alive. What this means is that we can't let global temperature go beyond 1.5 degrees from before we started burning fossil fuels at the start of the industrial period. Six months later, when I was in the climate negotiations in Paris, I met some of the comrades that I had met during my time in the Pacific, who invited me to speak at a rally that they had got permission to hold within the negotiation grounds of the COP in Paris. So I started chanting what I thought was a slogan that was speaking to the reality of people in small island states, 1.5 to stay alive, 
As I'm chanting at the top of my voice, I see that they are all shaking their heads. No, no, no. The slogan has changed. It's not 1.5 to stay alive. It is 1.5. We might survive. 1.5. We might survive. So let's be very clear. The struggle is not to save the planet. The struggle is to save humanity. If we continue the way we are, destroying our water sources, warming up the planet to a point we cannot grow food and so on, the end result is we will be gone, the planet will still be, and all those who are very concerned about saving the planet know that once we disappear as a species, the forest will recover, the oceans will replenish and so on. So let's be very clear. The struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is nothing more and nothing less than saving our children and their children's futures. So COVID-19 has had a positive impact in that it pulled back the curtains on the failure of our current systems. I was speaking to an audience in the United States a couple of years ago and was outlining the critical moment that humanity now finds itself in and described it as a convergence of crises. When it came to the question and answers, a woman raised a hand and said, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, yes, he inspired many of us in South Africa. And she asked me, what, do you know what his most famous speech was for? Thinking it was a trick question, I hesitantly answered, I have a dream. And she shouted back, yes, it was I have a dream. But when I hear you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. In this story lies an important lesson. This anecdote clearly expresses the need for humanity to rise to the challenge of leadership within this moment where a plethora of injustices are sweeping the world. It also highlights a conundrum that we are now experiencing as, as leaders in the climate justice movement. On the one hand, finding the right balance between speaking truth to power and the other, not sanitizing the magnitude of the crisis. Furthermore, it begs the question, how do we as climate justice leaders inspire action and remain truthful and sincere about the urgency of the moment while not totally demotivating, overwhelming and ultimately paralyzing people with fear and leading to inaction? On a more positive note, I think young people and new actors are emerging in the fight to respond to the climate crisis at a time when the window of opportunity is small and fast closing. In my opinion, the only constituency of activism today that understands the urgency of the moment that we find ourselves in is young people. Perhaps it is because young people know that they will bear the consequences of the absence of courageous, bold leadership in the current moment. Climate justice must be our guiding light in addressing the climate problem. The reality is that people facing the first and most brutal impacts of climate change are those that have contributed least to the problem. The picture painted demographically is plain to see which parts of the world that historically carry the most responsibility for emissions are affecting those who have had very little to do with releasing these emissions. This climate apartheid we face is inescapable and we must not be afraid to lay that bare on the table. Without that kind of brutal honesty, we will continue not to address the issue with the urgency that it calls for. Climate justice is fundamentally an issue of social justice. It is important that we recognize the environmental injustice affects the poor and marginalized the most. We need to ensure that the struggle to address poverty and inequality on the one end, and the struggle to address the environmental crisis more broadly and climate more specifically, must, can, and should be two sides of the same coin. As we reflect on the current state of the world, I'm reminded of the words of the African feminist author Akima Abbas. And I quote, rather than dismantle and reconstruct the institutions in our own vision, we instead use the colonial systems that existed. This will not get us to liberation. The challenge for the new generation is to rethink these systems, fighting battles on all fronts for fundamental structural and systemic change. What we saw at the end of the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009 was system recovery, system protection and system maintenance. And what was needed then and even more urgently needed now, which we are not hearing enough of, is system innovation, system transformation and system redesign. So what are the solutions? 
Decades ago, the feminist movement gave us this very powerful concept, intersectionality. They urged us that we needed intersectionality to advance gender equality. This is still true today. We need to have climate intersect with race, class, gender, and so on, in order to fully understand all of the complexities and to eventually make progress. The climate crisis that humanity faces is an issue that does not exist in isolation. It intersects with many injustices across the world, racial injustice, gender injustice, classism, and so on. The intersections between the crises that we collectively face as humanity has been increasingly brought to the fore by young people whose young people are embracing an intersectional understanding of these issues and it is providing these new movements with a deeper material understanding of the underlying structural and systemic mechanisms that are producing and reproducing these injustices. That being said, there is still much work that needs to be done here to embrace and employ an intersectional approach. However, the context is ripe for these approaches to bear fruit. Additionally, more and more people are also recognizing that these modes of action and thinking must also include drawing upon ancient wisdoms and practices that colonialism sought to exterminate. In terms of opportunities, the growing momentum of the climate movements around the world means that we can build more intersectional unity, which is critically important for progress on climate action. Additionally, the move towards more decentralized ways of operating is itself an opportunity. This makes it more difficult for repressive actions by the state, as well as building more leaderful movements that are less dependent on individual leaders. All of these possibilities for us, as we have not yet built a genuinely intersectional movement. The movements now are more intersectional than we've, been, than we've seen in the past, but we are certainly nowhere near where we need to be. I encourage an intersectional approach at all levels in order to break down the silo mentality that has developed in activism. Civil societies actually mimic the structures of government. As such, civil society tends to default to these very same silos. As a result, we do not find as much connectivity, synergy, and creativity that we need in order to advance our movements and organizations. Since my very first protest at the age of 15, which was focused on equality in education, I have been perplexed about why society has not been able to enact the necessary changes that the majority of us usually desire. When I joined Brisbane International, I was utterly dumbfounded by how many times I would be asked the question, why did you give up on human rights, gender equality, poverty, and so on, in order to focus on the environment? My answer then is the answer that I would still give now. I never gave up on any of those critical moments, movements. Instead, I've transitioned across organizations the same mindset of intersectional thinking because inequality and oppression cannot be resolved in isolation. Inequality intersects at all levels of society and political life. As such, I implore you all, step up and provide the world with much needed guidance and understanding of the year today for which I'm grateful for. We need to resist cognitive dissonance. The, the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change in 2018 said that we have 12 years to get carbon emissions to a reduced level by 50%. My question is, does anyone in this room truly believe that we are in 10 years? Considering that global leaders have already spent an entire year just in discussion. I should add that there has been some progress from global leadership on this front. At least most are not now denying the issue of climate change. However, there is still a lingering dilemma of the timeline. This is where cognitive dissonance comes into play. Basically, cognitive dissonance means uh, denying reality, right? Whilst many leaders openly accept climate change as an issue, the expediency for structural change is evidently not a priority. Most industry tycoons are paying lip service to climate change and will likely try to draw out this process for as long as there is still profits to be made in oil, gas, coal, mining, and other polluting industries. The reason we are not gaining enough momentum is that people who control the dominant industries, including the military complex, 
mining, pharmaceuticals, and so on, also control our governments. We will only see a real shift in climate change and the balance of power once we see a more spirited resistance by ordinary people, complemented by a range of strategies which needs to be realized at a global level. Martin Luther King, uh, speaking in 1965, said, my friends, as I come to the end of my speech, I want to note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant call maladjusted. Now we all want to live a well-adjusted life and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you that there are certain things in our world that are so unjust and immoral that good, decent people should refuse to be well-adjusted to. He then went on to say, I never intend to adjust myself to racial prejudice and religious bigotry and on the economy, he said, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. If that was relevant to the United States in the mid-1960s, it's a thousand times more relevant to the US, and it's pretty much relevant today to every country around the world. In a longer version of the speech, he said, I now call upon decent men and women to come together to set up a new global movement, to be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. So I'm urging you today, dear friends, don't accept the status quo. It's broken. Maybe it's not broken. Maybe it was designed to be exactly as it is. So in that sense, it's working fine, which is to give privilege to a handful of people, give a little more crumbs to those at the center so they will de de deliver the system. And then at the bottom of the pyramid, leave out 80% of the world's population. That is not acceptable. That cannot be the best that humanity can be. And therefore, we need to celebrate the idea of um, creative maladjustment, as well as remember the words of Albert Einstein when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. The other thing we need to do is call, cure the disease of affluenza. I would argue the worst disease we face today is not COVID, but affluenza. The current economic system has given us a situation where we have this pathological illness, where people have been led to believe that a good, meaningful, decent life comes from more and more and more material acquisitions. As a young exile in the United Kingdom at the age of 22, I was in, in my dorm room at Oxford University. I had a poster on my wall. The words on the poster came from the Cree people who said, only when the last tree is cut, the last fish has been caught, the last river has been polluted, will humanity realize that we cannot eat money. I want to believe that we can get to the realization quickly, enough, and in a very short time span that we have ahead of us, because the window of opportunity for taking action is small, 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 and closing as a result of extreme weather events being brought about as a result of climate impacts. I want you to, ask, to just ask the question briefly about your readiness to make the necessary changes. The collective global leadership all work together and operate from the same playbook, sharing the same strategies on how to suppress, depress, and control the narrative on climate change interventions. If the problem is at the very top, we need new wisdoms, new frameworks, and ways of thinking. When we look at where our effort goes, for example, if you look at where civil society organizations focus on, or where funders put their money, right? So we look at three levels of intervention. Macro change, which is focusing on governance change. Meso, which is focusing on policy change. And micro, micro which is act, the actual delivery of projects and services. If you look at the period of success for each of those, you know, if to, you can deliver a project start to finish in one year, if it's small scale and so on. Policy change, you might never succeed, but you know usually you cannot really do that that quickly. It takes at least two years or more. And by governance change, I mean, it's like ending apartheid in South Africa or trying to democratize the World Bank and the IMF, which is controlled by the rich nations of the North and the global North. Those governance changes don't happen quickly. Then we look at both the funding as well as actual effort being put at those three levels, you see that still most of what we can call civil society activity, 80% is um, 
in delivery of services, which is important because these people are at the cliff's end and we need to ensure that we pull them back from the cliff. However, let's be clear, this is treating the symptom and not treating the root cause of the problem. Often activism is focused on what people lack, but we also need to focus consciously on the power that people still have, notwithstanding the devastation they're facing. We have to put people at the center of our solutions and be aware that we cannot rely on government or business leaders if we are to mitigate climate change. They will need to be pushed into action from the bottom upwards. People need to organize themselves to take a diverse range of actions based on the skills and interests from tree planting campaigns to setting up community renewable energy initiatives. We will need to take private action for public good without government support while pointing out that this is what our leaders should be doing opportunities to mobilize people into bottom-up action can be identified in four areas. First, we need to harness people's autonomy as agents of change, as free-thinking individuals, and as people with the ability to make differences. People have power as voters and citizens in societies, engaging with democratic elections, even though many election systems have been captured, poisoned, and don't deliver the general will of the people anymore. To abandon that space without a fight would be reckless. We must not rely on voting once every four or five years, we should ask, what do we do between those years? And this infographic on the screen right now is showing that people still have power as custodians of ancient wisdom, as makers of culture and all form of art and so on. I would like to now conclude with a true story. It is a sad story, but is intended to be motivational. When I was 22 years old, as I was in South Africa, I had a conversation with my best friend and called Lenny. And Lenny asked me, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution we can make to the cause of humanity? And I said, that's very easy, giving your life. And he said, you mean going, participating in a demonstration, getting shot and killed? That's, I said, I guess so. He said, no, it's not giving your life, but it's giving the rest of your life. My friend Lenny was a very philosophical guy and he would say these things, which mostly we didn't understand at that age. But we then fled into exile in two different directions and I would eventually end up meeting him. Uh, you know, uh, I, I would eventually get the news two years later that my friend Lenny and three young women from our home city, Durban, were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in their bodies, the parents couldn't even recognize them. So I had to think deep and long about um, what that distinction between giving your life versus giving the rest of your life was. So what he was saying essentially that the struggle for justice is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And those of us, like those in this audience, who have had the privilege to understand the injustice of what is happening, I have a commitment to get actively, actively involved and to do so until those injustices have been eradicated or sustainability and sanity can be brought to addressing the climate situation. In closing, I would remind all of what I tell young people in particular, do not buy into, I'll die for my country. Buy into, I will live for the world. I will act to ensure that my country performs in a just way and does not harm people in the global south or elsewhere. This does not mean though, that you do not take necessary risks associated with civil disobedience and standing up against injustice. Rather, remember these words that I would like to share with you. These are the words engraved on a dear friend, Leninitis Tombstone. We shall pass this way but once. Any good, therefore, that we can do, or any kindness we can show to our fellow human beings, let us do it now, because we may very well not pass this way again. Thank you very much, Asante Sana. Kiitokset Kuminai Do tästä videosta. Ja kuten hän mainitsi, muutos vaatii sitä, että me tehdään muutoksia erinäisillä tasoilla. Ja että me ymmärretään historia, mikä on meidät johdattanut tähän päivään. Koska läpi historian erinäiset ihmiset on haalinnut valtaa. Ja se on johtanut meidät tänne. Joten jonkun pitää muuttaa, joidenkin asioiden on muututtava. Ja Kumi kanssa toi esille, että useasti me ehkä tahdotaan nähdä se, 
että nuorisossa on se tulevaisuus. Mutta on ymmärrettävä se, että me kasvetaan tosi erinäisessä maailmassa tällä hetkellä kuin ennen vanhaa. Joten se henkilökohtainen duuni, mitä meidän jokaisen pitää tehdä, on näyttäytyy myös tosi erilaiselta. Ja jos jäi jotakin aukkoja tästä, näitä oli tosi paljon erinäistä tahoja ja lyhyessä ajassa joudutaan muutenkin tänään käsittelemään laajoja kompleksisia asioita, niin jakakaa teidän ajatuksia toinen toistenne kanssa ja mäkin hengailen täällä jossakin, niin voi vetää sitä hihasta, jos haluaa jakaa jotakin ajatuksia. Ja myös sosiaalisessa mediassa voi osallistua keskusteluun Maailmakylässä vaikka Insta-tilillä tai hashtagillä, oliko se nyt maailma kylässä. 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 Jotenkin näin se meni. Esimerkiksi voi olla yksi paikka, jossa keskustelu voi osallistua. Nyt on vuorossa taas tämmöinen pienehkö vartin tauko ja sen jälkeen kuullaan videoterveinen videopuheenvuoro tuolta Euroopan komissiosta ja kestävästä kehityksestä ja kestävistä, nyt täytyy ihan luontata, investoinneista ja tasavertaisista kumppanuuksista, joita EU ja Euroopan komissio osaltaan edistävät. Mutta siitä siis vartin kuluttua lisää. Kiitos.